Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the last GA seminar of the year. My name is Rachel Perslowski, and I lead the Discovery and Engagement Program here at GA, and I'm going to be your chair for this presentation. Um, so I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of this land on which we virtually meet today. So for me here in Canberra, that's the Ngunnawal people, but we've actually got people from all over Australia and maybe even the world, and so I just want to acknowledge that they each have their own location linked with First Nations people. So before I introduce Bill properly, I did ask him if I could take a few minutes and just indulge the milestone of this being the last seminar in our series today for 2020. So I'm just going to take a minute or two to do that, and then we'll kick into Bill's introduction, and then he'll start giving his presentation. So after the pandemic, which we're all very familiar with this year, um, the Wednesday seminar series moved away from an in-person format that we held in Canberra here at Geoscience Australia to a wholly virtual format using this platform webinar jam. So this was not an easy feat. And before I go into some of the statistics, I just want to acknowledge the team that was involved in this. So a huge thank you to Doug Warrow, Robert Blythe and Chris Lewis for managing various aspects of the seminars through the year. And a huge thank you to Chris Nelson for basically leading the charge as our seminar series coordinator. It was a learning curve for all of us and I think everybody did really well. So thank you very much. In total in 2020, we ran 28 seminars this year and 22 of these were virtual. So we are gonna keep this model in the future, some sort of hybrid model, which we're still working on. We ended up with over 3,000 seminar participations, which represented over 850 unique attendees. Most of these were external to GA, so we quite dramatically changed our audience. So despite the many challenges of 2020, I will put a bit of an upspin on this, um, our move to virtual has meant that people from all over the world, including even Antarctica at one point, were able to participate in our Wednesday seminars. So again, thank you for everybody. Thank you for our speakers. And now I'm going to do my proper chair duties and introduce Bill. So our speaker this week is Bill Flynn, and he's coming to us from Adelaide, to the CSIRO offices there, although it looks like he's in his house today, as many of us are. <laughs> it's very salubrious. Yeah. Um, and he will be presenting on GLOBE, which stands for the Global Learning and Observations to Benefit the Environment. And this is a NASA-sponsored citizen science program. So the GLOBE program is an international science and education program that provides students and the public worldwide with the opportunity to participate in data collection and the scientific process to help meaningfully understand the Earth system and global environment. And Bill is our country coordinator for the GLOBE program. So Bill has taught in the UK and the Australian senior school education sector. So high school students, for those of you that know, that's a feather in his cap, I think. And he's also held positions as head of science and head of technology. He's a skilled educator and he's a passionate sustainability advocate. He developed and managed CSIRO Sustainable Futures programs for the last decade, and he therefore has a deep understanding of sustainability landscape in an educational context. I personally am really looking forward to hearing Bill's talk today, particularly about his efforts to engage, excite, and inspire students and the broader pub public in sustainability. So on that note, I would like to warmly welcome Bill Flynn. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, no one said anything about engage, inspire. I didn't see that in this morning. <laughs> so, uh, first of all, thanks to GA for uh, offering, for providing the opportunity to talk to uh, to people today about the GLOBE program. Uh, I suppose, really, just to give you some perspective, education and outreach is part of CSIR edu ed education. Uh, and CSIR education has been around pr for close to 40 years now. Uh, we work with a number of organizations, but I suppose ostensibly the work that CSIRO do is at the core of, of, of the, the resources that we develop. But we were approached uh, probably 18 months ago by the space agency. Uh, they have, as part of their strategic objective, an inspire pillar. I believe there are four or five pillars. I'm not quite sure where they are with that right now. And inspire is one of those pillars. So they're looking at how they can engage with young people, uh, highlight career opportunities in the space industry, and generally to get out there and, and, and bang the drum, as it were. So we uh, quite willingly and, and happily took on the role of, of reintroducing GLOBE in Australia. GLOBE's been around for quite some time. In fact, this year's the 25th anniversary of the GLOBE program. But GLOBE sort of 
I suppose it took a bit of a hiatus here in Australia, uh, and now we're looking to actually re resurrect the program. So hopefully today, uh, people watching in will get some idea of what the GLOBE program is, the kind of things you can do in that, in it, and the potential. So here we go. So if you can just bear with me while I get this thing up and running. You would have thought by now that we uh, we would be pretty au fair with uh, the work that we're doing. Hopefully, you can see the slide there. So, if you if you go onto the website, uh, this is what you'll actually see on the website. So, this is the Globe homepage. I'm just going to swap again. If you just bear with me, sorry. No, I can't get my presenter notes up for some reason. Sorry about this, folks. I'll just go back to this one and then we'll. So, if you go onto the Globe website, this is what you actually see on the Globe website. So, uh, you, everyone has full access to Globe. There's there's no membership as such. Uh, and on this particular website, you get information that's fairly regularly updated of some of the data that's being collected. So Globe, as Rachel said, is a, is a Globe program. It's available to everyone. And you can see from the stats that are up there that, uh, you know, it, it, it's quite a broad program and there's a considerable amount of data on there. Unfortunately, like most organizations that are dealing with the public, particularly if you, if the, if one of the, not necessarily a requirement, but one of the benefits of the program is students can actually get out there, work together uh, and collect data and citizen scientists, of course, it's not just a, a, a school-based program, then uh, the, the, the current situation has obviously impacted that. So the globe measurements is for September, as you can see, are still quite considerable. And these are uh, international, not just in Australia, of course, uh, considerably down on what you would expect as a monthly uh, data collection uh, uh, number. So if you look at the globe program, there's essentially, I suppose, six steps in the program. So once you have gone onto the Globe site and registered, if that's the process that you're going to go through, and we'll talk to that a little bit more shortly, uh, the idea is that then you're going to select a specific study site or a sample site. And this is where you're going to collect your data. And that's quite flexible. And that could be you know, someone's backyard, or it could be a fairly substantial uh, reserve or you know, a paddock. Could be anywhere, really. Depends on the nature of the data that you're going to collect. So once you've identified your sample site, and the reason we've got study and sample sites in there, it could be that your, your organization may well have more than one sample site. So you could be sampling, say, for the pedosphere, and you could be sampling for the hydrosphere. And they may well be two separate sites that, that are, are quite uh, apart from each other. So once you've got your site, identified your site, the idea is then that you're actually going to go out there and start taking measurements. And we say they're regularly on a regular schedule, but that, of course, will depend on the, uh, the particular uh, sphere and the protocols that you're, that you're actually going to engage in either yourself or with your students if you're a school-based organization. And again, we'll talk about school involvement and other organizations being involved in GLOBE uh, at some point during this session. So, of course, once you've collected your data, then your data you're going to submit. And you do that, submit that to the GLOBE database. Uh, and, you, and that can be done through a variety of different means. And again, we'll speak to that shortly. So if you like, step four, once you've done that, and these are not necessarily sequential. Uh, obviously, you can there's flexibility in the program, and you can sort of move around in and out and decide where you're going to go with this. But once you've got your data up there, you can actually retrieve your data. But you can retrieve data that anyone that's uploaded data to the GLOBE database uh, it's, it's all accessible. It's accessible to anyone that wants to access that data. And that could be scientists, citizen scientists, teachers, students, et cetera. 
So there's no limit and there's no, uh, again, no membership required to actually access that data. So once you've got up there, you can access your data. There's an opportunity then for students once they've got the data or anyone that's using that to communicate and collaborate. And again, one of the advantages of the GLOBE program is because it is a global program, uh, there is schools and teachers and students and other citizen scientists who are actually looking to collaborate. Particularly, there's, there's certainly an appeal to collaborate with a school uh, that's in a different country to yours. And that's a great opportunity for students to, 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 I suppose, develop their communication skills. There's also the opportunity as well, once students have, have uh, carried out some kind of data collection and analysis, they can submit their pro project into a virtual science uh, project that's operated by GLOBE. Uh, Currently, it's difficult for, for students to get together to do all that. So, of course, like everyone else, this is being offered online. But in the past, there has been the opportunity for students to come along to celebrate the work that they've done and share their investigations with students that are GLOBE participants from other parts of the world. And if you like, number six, and as I said, these are in no particular uh, order, is there's... Uh, Oh, I've, I've lost count of how many learning activities there are that are based around the GLOBE protocols. The idea is that, that you know, you can get your students involved in GLOBE type activities with the, hopefully with the intention that, you know, it will whet their appetite and I suppose generate sufficient interest for them to then actually want to go on there and collect data proper and upload their data to the GLOBE website. So if you like, those are the, those are six of the, I suppose, uh, essential steps, but not necessarily sequential. So how is GLOBE actually set to? If you've been on the GLOBE website, you'll have be, be familiar with this already. So GLOBE is set up around the four spheres and the four spheres you can see there. There's arguably a fifth sphere that they, the GLOBE call Earth as a system. And the Earth as a system actually incorporates protocols from a number of different spheres. It could be from one or two, it could be all four, depending on, on the Earth as a system uh, protocol or area of investigation that you select. So I've just chosen two at random of the spheres and I've chosen Pedosphere particularly because of the nature of this presentation and the organization. So you can see there are a number of different protocols up there and the protocols are actually developed specifically by NASA scientists. Because of course, at the end of the day, what the scientists want is they want reliable, accurate data that they can use in their research. So these protocols have been developed deliberately around scientific methodology and they're very in complexity. So some are quite simple uh, and not this one, of course, that's up there, but using things like if I take the atmosphere uh, sphere as an example. So one of the protocols in the atmosphere is two uh, cloud observations. So that is quite simply going out there and observing the type of clouds. And you can do that using a key to help you identify them. So it takes you through a, a, a systematic process to do that. Or you can use the Globe Observer app. And we'll talk about that again shortly. But the idea is that that's a fairly simple I suppose, way of introducing people to citizen science, but it's still a credible way of getting students involved in that data collection and analysis. But then you can sort of go beyond that and start doing things like hydrosphere, where you might be collecting, you know, turbidity, pH, nitrate measurements, all that kind of thing, where, you know, some high schools and some certainly universities would have access to that kind of equipment, uh, but not necessarily all schools in particular. So you can see with the pedosphere, there's a significant number. I think there's about 10 uh, different protocols uh, and some are relatively straightforward. So things like soil bulk density is a fairly straightforward thing to do. Soil moisture, gravimetric. But then again, you're relying on if you're going to do this in schools or if you're going to do it in, a, in an independent organization, universities, probably no issue. But some, some would have perhaps be challenged in uh, drying out soil samples to get a, a, an accurate measurement of the soil moisture content uh, for those samples. So there's pedosphere. The other one that uh, teachers seem to have more of an interest in, I think 
Pedosphere is great. Uh, and I taught in high school and taught year 12 chemistry. Uh, so, you know, being aware of soil structures, you know, the displacement of metals through uh, pH, effects of pH from acid rain and that kind of thing. Teachers and students find that quite interesting. Uh, but I think the pedosphere one in particular is going to appeal to perhaps agricultural schools that have got, got an agriculture or horticulture content in their curriculum. Biosphere is a bit more of an appeal because it's, it's, it's much broader and I suppose it's got a, a lends itself more easily to curriculum than some of the pedosphere protocols. So you can see again, biosphere, there's a significant number of protocols. I think around, again, around 11 protocols in particular. And the land cover classification uses the, and I, I forget, but the acronym is MCU. So it's a standard method for actually classifying land cover uh, sample sites. So again, this is one that's quite popular. And again, you know, teachers in particular are interested in, you know, what's the frequency of recording for these kind of things? Because realistically, you know, some things are easy to record daily, perhaps something like temperature where you can set up data loggers to actually record that automatically. But some of the other data collection exercises perhaps are a bit more of a challenge. And of course, teachers are quite busy. So trying to fit this into their busy schedule uh, can often be a challenge. So one of the things that we're working on right now is, you know, how can we, if you like, put the package, a package together that appeals to teachers that, that's cross-curricular, but meets the needs of individual curriculum areas as well. And that's a, quite a lengthy exercise, but we, we're quite keen to, to, to get on top of that so that teachers can see at a glance some of the advantages and benefits of using the GLOBE program. So something like Green Up, Green Down, again, is, is fairly explanatory. So we're talking about you know early spring, late winter, and then autumn, early winter. So probably two or three weeks. And the idea is that students would just go out there, they'd measure bud growth. Um, that kind of thing. So, so pretty straightforward uh, and not a major commitment. You know, three weeks a year, once during the year is, is certainly doable. Some of the others are a bit more of a challenge. So if you decide that you, you are interested in GLOBE and you'd like to use the GLOBE program, either, an, either as an individual or as a teacher in the school, whether it be primary school or secondary school, because it's it certainly uh, caters and has the sort of range of activities in there that will be appropriate for primary right through to secondary. Uh, but we've also had people like scout groups and girl guides using certainly things like the uh, Observer app, because uh, that's a great way of, of introducing some kind of uh, team activity, uh, but, but you can run it nationally. So if you are a national organization like the Scout Movement, then there's the, the, the possibility then of, you know, collaborating with other scout groups and dare I say competing with other groups to see who can collect, you know, the, the, the most data, data that's going to be used in a useful way. So, and we go through the options. So option A, uh, relatively straightforward. You get on there, you actually register to the program and you complete the, the e-learning. Option B is using the Observer app, and option C will be just accessing the activities and using the data that's on there. So if you talk about option A in particular, so what teachers or individuals need to do, because when you go on there, it asks you to register as a teacher. The reality is that we've got people on there that are running uh, you know, STEM groups and things like that where they're going on and they're actually registering as a teacher and registering their facility. Uh, the idea being that by having a teacher account, if you like, and again, there's no cost to this. This is it's absolutely free. Everything's free on the GLOBE program. Uh, it means that you can create student accounts. So you can use this for things like homework and independent study or field trips even. So to get the students out and collect some data in the field. There's two, if you like, there's, there's, there's two ways you can actually, well, there's three, but Globe will prefer you, you just use one of the two main ways of actually uploading your data. So you've gone through the training process uh, and there's an introductory module. And in fact, tomorrow we're going to go through the introductory module. And each module then has a, just a short 15 question multiple choice uh, assessment activity. And, uh, you know, I make no apologies about the fact that these things are done deliberately to I suppose, express to people that are going to use the program that this is quite a serious program. 
you know, the data that you're going to collect hopefully will be used by someone in their research. Uh, you know, often it's used for ground two thing, things like satellite imagery. So, you know, at the end of the day, we want really good, reliable, accurate data. So go on there. So complete the introductory module, and then you identify which of the spheres you have a particular interest in. So if your interest for argument's sake is pedosphere, then you would complete the introductory pedosphere module. And it's just a series of PowerPoint slides, and then again, another short assessment. You can leave the slides open, so you can sort of, if you, if you like, cross-reference. So there's no close down the PowerPoint, and then you've got to complete the quiz. You can flick backwards and forwards between the two if you're not confident that you've got the right answer. And I, it, I, Globe are quite generous in as much as you only need 80% to actually qualify as being trained in that particular sphere. So once you've done the sphere training, then you would identify the individual uh, protocols that you would like to be trained in. And again, you go through the same process. So a set of fairly straightforward, uh, quite brief, but, but factual slides around the particular protocol that you've decided to, to, you know, whether you're doing it as an individual or whether you're going to do it as a school with your school students, and then, of course, the, the assessment. And then once you've done that, then basically you're out there collecting the data. So the ways you can upload your data, if you've done the, gone through the registration and training process, you can actually go onto the website and you can use the desktop form to submit your data. Or you can use the mobile app. So if you've got, if you're using tablets, mobile phones, mobile phones not particularly, but certainly tablets, iPads, etc. You know, downloading the mobile app, you may not necessarily have a Wi-Fi connection, but certainly students out in the field can load their data into the app, into the form in the app, and then once you've got back into your establishment and they've got a Wi-Fi connection, then you can upload that data to the website. So that data is not lost, uh, and you know. If you think about it, it's a great way as well to get your students using digital technology. So just to recap, if you're going to go for option A, and of course, at the end of the day, I would much prefer that you do that, and certainly Globe would, because uh, this is the way that they're uh, going to collect their data uh, through, the, through the program itself, which covers all the spheres and all the protocols. So create your account, go through the sphere, so identify which spheres you're interested in, complete the training, complete the protocol training for that particular sphere. And it, it could be that you complete several protocols. You know, if you're going to do sphere for argument's sake, then you, you probably do three or four protocols. So you can get a comprehensive set of data uh, around the, you know, the, the water body or whatever it is that you're actually collecting that data from. So as I said, once you've done that, you get, get your students out there. Your students, of course, don't have to complete the protocol training. You only need to do that as the leader. Uh, and here we've got a couple of examples where macroinvertebrates, you know, so if you've got a water body, stream, pond, lake near your facility or establishment, then this will be a great one to do. And again, you can compare the macroinvertebrates with your particular location. You can do that nationally, compare nationally, and you can compare globally. So the length of a classification, again, a fairly simple process. Uh, and I'm sure that person's demonstrating because this is certainly a hands-on opportunity for students to get in there and get involved. The mosquito habitat mapper. So Asia, Asia Pacific region, which is the part that the region that Australia is part of. Uh, so we're actually hoping to run a mosquito habitat uh, exercise over the next six to 12 months. And, you know, we'll really be pushing the, uh, the observer app. And this particular one is an example of the Observer app, the Mosquito Habitat Mapper. So what it does, it gives you the opportunity to identify uh, mosquito habitat. But if you've got a, and they're relatively cheap these days, a microscope attachment for your mobile phone, the students can collect larvae and actually identify the species of mosquito that's in that habitat. So a really useful exercise. And again, you know, with with the changing climate and certain mosquito uh, disease vectors being traveling further and further south. So things like dengue, dengue and uh, Ross River, you know, it's certainly useful for scientists to actually keep a track of what's happening in that space. So as I said, uploading your data is relatively straightforward. You can use the desktop form. You can use the mobile app on tablets. You can actually email your data in. 
uh, the globe administrators, NASA essentially, they'll accept that. They prefer you didn't, to be honest, uh, because the desktop form of the mobile app is, is managed automatically. Emails, I'm sure, have to be dealt with manually. So that's quite labor intensive. So really quickly, if you're going to use the app with your students, you're going to take them out into the field to collect some data. Just download the app to your mobile device, tablet, iPad, whatever. So once you've created the account uh, on the GLOBE website, then the students, you can actually create up to 50 student accounts. So the students just would log in using their username and password that's been allocated by the teacher. Students have access to that, but they don't have administrator rights. So they can't sort of, you know, they can't use it like Zoom where you can communicate between students. Uh, the teacher basically or the administrator has full control over that. So once you've selected Sphere Protocol, get your data in there, send your measurement to Globe. It's as simple as that, essentially. So once your data is up there, you've got a variety of ways that you can actually retrieve your data. So again, if you've gone on to the Globe website, and I suggest that you go on there and just have a play around, because there's, there's no commitment when you, when you get on there. You don't have to register anything to use it. The only registration is when you, if you want your students or whoever it may be, could be yourself if you're doing it as an individual to upload data, then obviously you've got to go through the registration process and create an account. But all of this is available even without an account. So you can actually select data, to view and use the visualization system. So that will give you a map. And of course, this map where I've just focused in in Australia, and that's at land cover class. The little brown dots that you can see are locations where there's been a land cover classification activity. So it actually identifies. And there's quite a significant amount of information attached to that particular uh, location once you've honed in on that. The other way you can access the data or use the data is using the CSV. So if you go on there and use the advanced data access tool, you can actually search uh, for the particular data that you want, or you can use the Globe API. So if, you, if you're a programmer, you can actually set program up so that it, that will retrieve data uh, specifically, but you can actually set that up so it will retrieve data regularly. So if you want, you know, I don't know, maximum minimum temperatures, you know, every day in a particular area for the next six months, you can actually write code in Python to do that for you. So what I thought I'd do is, is sort of quickly go through the options that we've just flashed up there. So if you're using the visualiz visualization system, uh, you can see, I suppose it's very much like using, say, GIS, where you've got layers and filters, uh, you've got different map representations, so you, you can use a satellite image if you like. So it's quite flexible, quite versatile. So again, you can see the uh, protocols that down the left-hand side there, the four protocols we talked about before. So in this particular one, we've gone for land cover. Uh, but when you, some of the protocols, when you actually go in there and look for that data, some of them have an option of actually providing photographs as well. So when you do a land cover classification, you can input the data and it uses the MCU system to identify that. And it gives you a set of parameters to help you do that. But you can also take images. So using your mobile phone, whatever, you can photograph the, the area that you've selected as your site for the land cover classification. And you can upload that data, that photograph, so that not only do people have the information, the data, if you like, around that particular site, but they also have some images as well to work off. So again, quite versatile. So in the bottom right-hand corner, you can see there's a legend. So what that enables you to do, it means that at a glance, you can see the amount of data that's being collected at that site. So for this particular one, you would expect that, you know, there may only be one or two classification uh, data collection activities at that particular site, because once you've done your land cover classification at that site, it's unlikely you're going to do it again. You might do it, at, you know, a couple of times during the year at different times of the year if it's affected seasonally. But generally speaking, you would just do that once. But then you may well use that site for other data collection activities. You may use it for, you know, minimum, maximum temperatures, soil temperature, surface temperature. Uh, so there's a myriad of different things that you may well do at that site. 
So if you have a look in the just below the receiving bar where the where the yellow oval is, so the yellow oval you can see there you've got two options. You've got measurements and data counts. So data counts clearly gives you some idea of the data that's been collected at those particular sites over a given period. So you can set the parameters for the time. Whereas if you go into measurements, it generally speaking, it gives you measurements on a particular day. There is a way of actually accessing that data, not necessarily visually like that, but certainly through the ADAT or through the API, you can actually access measurement data over you know, a month, a week, 10 years, whatever you decide uh, is of particular interest to you. So that's the visualization system. So again, all I've done is sort of zoom in on what looked like Alice Springs. And here we talked about the photographs. So when you have a look at site info, the site info gives you, uh, you know, the, the longitude and latitude. So the GPS coordinates, it'll also give you information about uh, what that site is in particular uh, and what the recording is. So whether it's a, you know, a land cover classification, whether it's a, uh, hydrosphere, whether it's a pH reading or whatever. So it gives you in there. What it does as well, it gives you a particular date. So if you go into data counts, it may be that on one particular day, they've got a significant number of data counts, or that could be spread over a period. So again, you know, there's lots of information there. And often you have to sort of drill down if you want specific, but certainly to get you started, this is a really good way of throwing up that data, have a look at the size of the lozenge. And if you've got quite a large lozenge there, then that would suggest that there's quite a lot of data being collected from that particular site. So as I said before, here we've got the same thing, uh, but now we've introduced the images. So you can see some of the images, uh, some of the photographs rather, some of the areas or sites don't have a photograph associated with them. So that means that people have obviously gone out, they've done a land cover classification using the key, uh, but they've not bothered taking any photographs and that's perfectly fine. So the date that you've got up there, so if, if depending on, on which of the protocols you choose, even though it's given a recent date, in fact, yesterday, I think, or choose Monday's date, uh, it takes you right back to the or original if you like the, the, the sort of formation of that particular protocol. So when that protocol became available, it will, it will upload the, the measurement data from day one right through to the date that you've got up there. You do have control over that. Uh, and if you click on there, it just gives you the option of downloading the measurement data uh, as well as doing it through the ADAP and through the API. You can do it this way, but I find personally, the, the easiest and the quickest way is to upload the data counts. And that way that gives you a clear indication as to some of the sites that have got significant amounts of data. Because what you find is that particularly, as I say, over the, over the last six months or so with coronavirus, because schools and students aren't able to get out the way that they were, some of the sites that were quite active are perhaps not so active. Currently, I'm sure in the new year, when things start to hopefully return to something like normality, then those sites will become much more active again. So <clears throat> once you've identified, so in, in this particular case, we're just looking at temperature, so air temperature. And this could be, you know, students recording manually going outside using digital thermometers or traditional alcohol thermometers, or they may well have data loggers and sensors set up. Uh, and we'll talk to that a bit more shortly. Uh, so what you can do is once you've loaded your measurements, you can see that this school has been quite active over the last 12 months. And they've got uh, daily uh, solar noon temperatures recorded for the last 12 months. Now, it may well go back beyond 12 months, but this is just one I chose at random. And the reason I chose this one, uh, A, because it's in the middle of the states, Las Vegas, and I was just curious to see what the temperature's like in Las Vegas, being in Adelaide, and we just had 40 some degrees last week. Uh, but they've got, a, they had a reasonable size lozenge, which suggested they've got a, a, a reasonable amount of data. So again, all that information's there if you needed it. So how much data they've collected, information about the school, and information about the site, so where its location is. And you can see there, there's a sort of snapshot there. So you've got daily averages, maximum, minimums. So there's some great sort of data manipulation activities here. If you, if you are a classroom teacher and you've got students, 
So even younger students, you can start to produce biographs and things like that from this. If you decide that you would prefer your students to have raw data and get them to do some data analysis that way, then probably the, the data access tool is probably the easiest thing to use. Uh, and again, you can set the parameters. So give them a challenge. You know, you can do this at home. If you're homeschooling, you can do it. If you've got it running a, you know, I don't know, probably difficult if you were doing it with a, uh, with a scout group or something. But certainly, certainly with, okay, we've got a message flashed up there. So certainly in a school or a university or TAFE or uh, after school club or a homework club or something like that, you, you could definitely uh, run that as an activity with your students. So the other way you can do it if you are a programmer is to use the API. So again, you can set, uh, probably you've got more scope with setting individual parameters using the, uh, the API. What you can do as well is once you've uh, got the API, if you take the URL and post the URL directly into uh, a web browser, uh, you can actually retrieve the data using J JSON. Is it JSON? I must admit this is not my area of expertise, so I'm learning as, as we go along to use things like uh, ArcGIS and JSON. So this is an area that I'm working on quite right now with the GLOBE program to see how this can be better used in schools. So you can see there you've got URL, post that in, and then you get the data will come up. You can, and again, you can use that data. And again, you know, here you've got the opportunity to actually write code if you're a coder, so you can retrieve that code or that uh, data automatically. And you can do that on a, uh, on a sort of regular basis. So, if you've gone, I like to think as option A is the, the, the kit and caboodle, as we would call it. So you get everything in there, you get the opportunity to upload data. But accessing data, visualizing data, uh, using the protocols, et cetera, you can still do that without actually registering. So it, as I say, it's still quite versatile in the way that you can use the program. So if you decide you're going to go down option B instead, the Globe Observer app, uh, the Globe Observer app's being updated. Uh, and I think it's probably done by now, but one of the beauties of the Observer app is that the Globe administrators frequently run campaigns. So the campaigns often uh, are able to be managed or you're able to participate using either the Globe Observer app or, and sometimes both, the Globe program. But the Globe Observer app for me is just, you know, it's the ubiquitous uh, mobile device, smartphone app where. The different series, rather than have young people sat at home playing a game or Tetris or whatever they do these days on the smartphones, Facebook, you can actually get out there and, and do something useful with your mobile phone. Pretty straightforward. Download the Observer app, select the protocol, and there's four areas currently. Uh, and Globe are working on a fifth area right now, but four areas in particular where you can use a mobile phone. And again, you know, there's, there's sequential instructions. So it's not go on there and sort of, you know, fumble your way through. It's quite clear uh, in the way that it's done. Uh, and you just basically follow the scientific process through. And again, pretty versatile in the way that you can use it. The beauty of the Globe Observer app as well, and this has recently been modified, is if if this if the school or if a teacher administrator and this is where it's really useful things like scout groups and other social groups is the administrator actually has control over who can join the team so they can set up a team uh, and there's essentially three options so the administrator will is given a referral code so if they want someone to join the team that they've set up they if they supply that referral code to that individual or group of individuals when, there's, when the people go on to use the app, when they've downloaded the app, they go on to use it. If they enter that referral code, then any data that they collect will actually be allocated to that team. So administrators have the option of inviting people, and they can do it that way. They can actually close the team. So when they first set the team up, they can have as many people as they like in the team, but that's then closed. So no one can actually join. Once it's closed, it's closed. 
the administrator actually needs to contact Globe to get the administrator rights uh, reinstated if they want new people to come in. But essentially, once that's set up, it's closed. And then the third option is just to leave it open and anyone can actually contribute to it. So if you, like myself in Adelaide, you could go on there, search for a group in Adelaide, uh, and you can actually go out there and do, I don't know, mosquito habitat mapping and submit your data to that particular open team, as it were. Uh, and again, as I say, really useful. And this, and again, you could use this on a mobile device, so it could be used on a, a iPad, a tablet, etc. So not necessarily just limited to a mobile phone. So I just thought we'd quickly go through a couple of examples. If you if you decided that that was going to be the way that you were going to go, I know my granddaughters they use it. They go out and they do some clouds observations, and I just think it's great that they can ring me up and say, you know, we've been out today, Granddad, and we've seen. Uh, Jumeol Imnis or whatever they call clouds. And it's wonderful that they can do that. that we, can, we can share that experience. So when you go on there, all you need to do is provide your location, uh, go through the steps, and you, if you like, manually identify the clouds using the keys and the images that you're given. And you can see up there the kind of thing that NASA are looking for, cloud types, opacity, etc. And then take your photos in different uh, orientation, so north, south, east, west, up and down, and then submit that. Now, the wonderful thing about this, and I think this is probably a, a strategic move on behalf of, of NASA and the GLOBE people, is if you actually time your observation for when there's a satellite overpass, a flyover, you get a confirmation email from, well, you can opt in to receive a confirmation email from NASA that will actually uh, confirm, if you like, the accuracy of your observation based on the observations from the satellite. So I just think, you know, this is a really good way of, of anyone that's sort of, I suppose, uh, you know, interested in science, but not necessarily engaged to the point where they go out to something like this, the, the opportunity to get, you know, an email from NASA, it's not every day you get an email from NASA, is certainly a big selling point. But from an education perspective, you know, clouds are an important part in the environment. Uh, you know, clouds affect climate, essentially. Uh, so it's a great way of introducing some technology, the ability to go out there and collect some data, and yet meet the education needs and curriculum that teachers need to do in their lessons, of course. So I thought I'd just show you what happens when you actually go on there. So if you're thinking about using this, uh, so you can actually go onto the Globe Observer website and you can request a satellite overpass schedule or you can set your phone to give you an alert when there's a satellite overpass. So this is one I did a few weeks ago from what I remember. And you can see clearly it gives you the time where it's actually overpassed. So you just put in your uh, location and they'll actually send you this table that gives you them. I think it probably goes for about a week to two weeks. Uh, so you're not, you know, you don't have to go straight out there that, that same day and do your, your observation. You have got some flexibility there. So once you've decided, you go out there, take your photograph, and this is what you get back from NASA. So on the green, in the green on the right is my observation. And please bear with me if I've not been particularly as accurate as the satellite. And then on the left, uh, in the center, in the yellow column, is the uh, is the satellite observation. So then it compares the two. So at a glance, you can see, you know, were you, how accurate were you? I mean, I predicted that there was greater than 90%. Uh, the satellite saying that there's broken cloud, at around 70%, 69.7% So if you've done this and you're not quite sure what all that means, NASA are really good because they give you a link. So you can actually go onto a, a key, if you like, or a, a FAQ, so you can see what the individual sections mean. Uh, and that probably now means it makes a bit more sense, particularly to young students who are not quite sure, uh, to be able to see a, a key that explains and then be able to go back and compare their observation with what satellite image has said. Uh, then obviously that adds a, an extra dimension to that option. The mosquito habitat mapper, as I've said, the Asia Pacific region, we're hoping to run a campaign. Uh, probably early next year for six months or so, where we'll be encouraging people to go out and do some mosquito habitat uh, 
uh, observations and send their data in. Of course, it's not just us that use it, NASA will use it. And I think uh, probably a couple of years ago, Adelaide University were doing some mosquito uh, mapping citizen science activities. So, you know, this is information that's going to get used, not just locally, but nationally and perhaps even internationally. So here's a little sort of activity I suggested that teachers might want to do if they've gone out and done some uh, habitat mapping with their students is, you know, they can talk about what are the ideal conditions for mosquito larvae. You know, we all know when it's warm and wet, that's when we tend to get more mosquitoes around. So in Adelaide, we tend not to get, we get a fair bit of warm, but not much wet. So would we have the same uh, level of mosquito uh, populations here in, in Adelaide, say for in comparison to somewhere like Darwin or Cairns? So how would you predict mosquito abundance? Uh, and why would it vary by state and territory? So what might be the factors that influence that? So again, a nice little education activity, getting students using mobile devices, some digital technology, but some good old fashioned research. So on to the final option, if you like, option C. So with option C, there's no, there's no obligation to register. You can just go on there. You can download the activities. Uh, I think there's something like 70 protocols. So there's probably something like 100 plus different activities that you can use. Uh, some, uh, you know, are pretty straightforward, no equipment required. Uh, others, you might need, you know, some kind of recording data collection device, uh, but they're really useful. Uh, and this is an example of one. So this is a primary through to middle school activity. The one I've selected is primary focused. Uh, and I think the great thing for me is that there's a considerable amount of information on there, but the purpose and the overview really give you a sense of what the activity is around. So just by reading those two little sections at the beginning would give an educator a pretty good idea whether it's something that they would like to use with their students. Uh, and it's something that, and, and again, the idea is that, you know, this it, it's almost an appetite wetter, if you like. You would look at this and go, yeah, this is great. I'll get my students to do this. It may even be a homework type activity. But then, you know, embrace the program. Get on there and actually register. Get your students collecting data and get them analyzing and, and accessing data from other countries, other students. So they, they all have a similar format. So, you know, once you're familiar with the format, you know, whether you're primary, secondary, middle school, or whether you're doing something that's quite complex or straightforward, you can see at a glance whether it's something that you're likely to use. So often they have a recording sheet of some kind. And again, these are electronic, so you can actually get these sheets, uh, perhaps modify them to your, to your audience, you know, whether they're, you know, uh, Ignite or advanced students, or whether the students are perhaps not necessarily engaged so much as you would like. Most of these things, you know, are, are very uh, versatile in sort of appeal and ability level. So that particular activity itself, the Odyssey of the Eyes, it introduced the idea of ratios and, and proportions, uh, but there's a there's a significant amount of there are STEM activities in there because you're going out, you're going to do some measurement and geometry. So the idea is students build some kind of, uh, ideally some kind of 3D plot, uh, but you could do that computer-based, you could use digital technology, you could use, you know, good old fashioned shoe boxes and various other things to build something in your classroom. There's certainly the option of, uh, you know, writing prose, uh, Recount, there's a number of things you can do as regards, you know, English content. And of course, you've got science as a human endeavor, because the idea is, I think, to, in that particular one, to introduce the idea of uh, satellites and Earth, Earth observation. And then again, technology, significant uh, opportunity in the technology spectrum. So I'm just going to quickly go through some of the things that you might use it for. So here's the cloud observations for 12 months to March 20, I think it's March, yeah, 1st of March 2020. So you can see there's a significant number of clouds observations for obvious reasons. This is a popular one. It's easy to do. You can do it using the Globe Observer app or as these young guys are using here, these young boys are using, you can actually use the Globe provided key that leads you through the process and then go back and upload the data. So there's the chart. You can link that to a, 
a bomb website. So is there a connection between clouds and weather? You know, can you use the clouds to predict weather, et cetera, et cetera. So nothing particularly new there, but a lot of students don't make that connection be between cloud types and the weather. So again, fairly basic, but that could be pushed into something quite, you know, when you start to talk about water cycle, climate change, et cetera, there's certainly the potential in there to use this kind of activity. So temperature is an easy one to do. If, you, if you're going to get people to go out and collect daily temperature, just a simple basic thermometer would do. If you're going to record maximum minimum temperatures and average temperatures, then ideally you need an instrument shelter. And again, this is on the GLOBE website. There's a set of instructions on how you might actually build your own instrument shelter. Uh, but the idea is that then you would go out there, you would have some kind of recording sensor, data logger, and students perhaps will go out once a week and collect that data. So what I thought is we'll just have a quick look at an activity where you can do temperature. So again, I just randomly selected two areas. And again, based on the size of the lozenge, uh, and this is zoomed in, of course. Uh, but if you zoom out, you can see these in relation to everything else that's around that particular area. So just cho chose two. Uh, that are two different elevations, and now you might use that as an activity with your students. So here we've got two. So what, what I did is downloaded the temperature data from both of those two sites, and there's a difference. I think one's something like 27 meters above sea level, and the other one's 800 meters above sea level. So, you know, you can see that both graphs have followed the same trend, almost mirroring each other, but there's a difference in recorded temperature. So the idea of getting your students to look at elevation and the effect uh, and temperature rate is your rising elevation. So that, again, they can produce graphs from that. You can supply the raw data or you can actually give them the graphs to analyze. Uh, again, as I said, the flexibilities and, and the choices are entirely up to the user. Earlier we mentioned green up, green down. So this is a, a relatively short. Uh, certainly with the maximum minimum temperatures, you wouldn't need to do any recording. This one suggested that you actually get your students out there recording. Obviously, you're going to take, you know, necessary precautions. Uh, you know, it might be that students are wearing gloves in case they're handling something that's, you know, that, that they're not aware of that could be uh, potentially hazardous. Uh, but because the program states based, most of the things that they've put up there for the green up, green down will be states based flora and fauna. So I just quickly went through uh, the Atlas of Living Australia and identified some of the areas that we might use here if you were going to do it. So it is a, a series of different uh, uh, flora that you might use for the green up, green down. So I suppose finally, why, why would you choose to do GLOBE if you're an educator? Uh, students are getting out there. You know, they not only are they getting out there being exposed to their local environment, but they're getting an increased awareness of, of the environment around them, not just nationally, but internationally. The information that they collect will contribute to understanding of the Earth system. So there is no doubt, you know, if you go on there, NASA scientists in particular, but other scientists have access to this data. So this data, not all of it, of course, but some of it will certainly be used at some point. Now, whether it's in research or whether it's, as I say, to, to ground tooth existing data uh, or whether it, you know, it's just basically surveying sites to see if there's you know, climate impact, it certainly will be used at some point. It sits across a number of different curriculum areas, you know, so if you've got students that aren't particularly engaged in science, then they, then certainly the opportunity to introduce other areas of curriculum and other subject areas that they may have an interest in, uh, in particular science and maths. It's very hands on, as you can see from the examples we've looked at, uh, you know, the students are doing the recording, the students that and for me, the great thing is that, you know, once they've uploaded their data, they go into the visualize system or use the ADAT or the API, they can actually see their data's up there. You know, so it's not actually, it's not being put into an exercise book, uh, never to see the light of day again. It's actually up there and other people can use it. It's real world data collection. Uh, you know, if you go on to the GLOBE website and look at the GLOBE Observer app, there are NASA scientists that will tell you that they use particularly things like the clouds observation. And they often run a camp campaigns so trees around the globe is a campaign that was running uh, 
in fact, probably still running right now. And the idea is that, you know, scientists will use the data that students are collecting for that particular campaign. So there's, there's a significant number of reasons to use this, it's certainly in an education setting, but certainly from a citizen science, if you're thinking about the Globe Observer app, definitely get out there and use it. So as I mentioned earlier, if you are an educator, this particularly applies to you. We, we are sponsored or the program sponsored by the Space Agency, Australian Space Agency, and they've generously agreed to supply what we call in data collection kits. So if you are an educator or know an educator, whether it's primary or secondary, uh, or even tertiary, and they would like to collect data in the field, if you, I'll put my email address up shortly, if, if you know someone that's interested in doing that and they have a particular request, so let's say for argument's sake, they own Arduinos or Raspberry Pis and would like some temperature, barometric pressure, humidity sensors to use in the field to contribute to GLOBE. I must admit that's the caveat. They have got to agree to actually contributing to the GLOBE database. So it's one thing supplying the, the equipment and I'm happy to do that, but the proviso is that they, they must agree to actually upload that data to the GLOBE database. So there's a, a number of different bundles, if you like, that they might think about. So the weather bundle, so they'd be looking at things like rain collector, temperature, humidity, barometric pressure, uh, perhaps even a weather station. I don't know if it would stretch to a weather station because a good reliable weather station is quite expensive, uh, but certainly water quality, you know, things like uh, pH sensors, nitrate sensors, turbidity, uh, tubes, that kind of thing would definitely be an option. So if, if you do know someone or you are yourself in that situation, here are my contact details. So my contact details, william.flynn at csiro.au. Uh, I'll be more than happy to receive an email saying, yep, we, we would love to contribute to GLOBE and we're particularly interested in X, Y, Z. Uh, then we'll take that discussion further. And I think that's probably it from me. Thank you very much, Bill. That was really good. Um, we're actually got about two minutes, so we have quite a lot of questions in there. I think what we're going to do is just answer one or two very quickly, and we will follow the rest up through, um, we'll send you the chat transcript, Bill, and then you can either get in touch with those people directly or they can email you because they now have your email sure. address. Um, so I will prioritize John Pring's question because he was the one that invited you originally. So his question was towards the beginning of your talk, and he said, can the school function be used with the teaming functionality? Yes, it's a short question. So if you use Teams in the Globe Observer app, once the teacher set up an account and a site on the Globe program, any, they, they, you actually get a referral code. So if that teacher or administrator, because it doesn't have to be a teacher, it could be a parent or a STEM professional that goes in and works with the students. Once that account's set up, they're given a referral code. If you supply the team members with that referral code, anything they collect will actually be allocated to the school's team. Thanks for that. Would you mind popping on your video, Bill, just for the last yep, couple of minutes? Sorry. That's okay. Um, and I've got a few questions from Richard Blewett and Yanuka Ataniaki. Um, I'm going to take, I think, one of Yanuka's first ones. She said, um, do you have a pool from which one can select groups of students? In other words, do students submit EOIs to be considered so that researchers can then pick an appropriate group? Uh, not, not that I'm aware of. There is a blog. So there is a, a STEM professionals blog on the GLOBE website. So probably the best way I would suggest to doing that is if you put your request into the blog, because you can imagine that we've got schools and, and groups around the world. So if you want, you know, to contact someone and what happens if you register, uh, I'm not sure if you need to register, but if you, you can actually access the registered person and they will often put up there that they're willing to collaborate so then if you if you select collaborate then it will send them an email notifying them that you are happy to actually collaborate with that school or that that particular establishment yep. excellent 
Um, we had a question from Richard, Richard Blewett, who asked, will the Australian Space Agency be looking to other bundles? So he's noting particularly that there's nothing for the petosphere, such as soil moisture yet. Yeah, good question. I, I, th I think the short answer to that is I think curriculum will actually drive, you know, which, which areas of globe get developed further. I would like to see petosphere develop further, mainly because with CSIRO we've got land and water and we've got a land and water facility, which is literally down the road from where I am. And it's one of the areas that I suppose gets the least expert. It's not as glamorous as health and biosecurity and food and nutrition. So, you know, you've got a bunch you know, of geologists. I know I'm speaking. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I, I think in the public eye, not obviously not yeah. to me uh, and not to GA people, but yeah, it's. I don't think it gets the same media exposure as health and biosecurity. And, and I'm not just talking about CSR. I'm talking about just generally in the community. So I would love to see pedosphere and we csr are actually working we i just i need to be careful how much i disclose because it's not official yet keep an eye on the csr education and outreach because we are looking at a developing a program around sensor networks in agriculture and food production so i think that will be a great opportunity for ga perhaps to get involved in that uh, certainly to yeah to contribute to that at some stage sounds like we might be in touch then yes um just a final question from lee franks what sort of time frame is there for feedback to the observers or students once the data has been formatted and archived like when do they actually get to see their results uh it's uh, almost immediately when you collect that data it's it's up there probably within 24 hours it will be up on the globe database uh if you've used the globe observer app for say a clouds observation, generally the email that comes from NASA comes within a week. Just, you know what students are like, they expect the email to come, you know, as soon as they've sent the photographs off with the yeah. cloud. <laughs> yeah. Good for so them to learn a bit of that, of yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. We're, um, we're gonna actually send this chat um, transcript to you, Bill, so that you can you know do with it what you will. There's some other good comments in there as well and some suggestions that I think would be of interest to you. Um, thank you so much for that. It will be available on recording on our YouTube channel at some point, and Bill will let you know when that happens so you can send that link out to your networks as well. Um, I guess just finally, I want to say thank you all for coming to the last Wednesday seminar of this year, and thank you, Bill, for presenting. We hope that those of you who are regular attendees enjoyed our diverse range of talks. I think this was an excellent cap to it. Um, and we wish you all a safe and happy and festive holiday season as we cap off this very unique year. Um, and we look forward to seeing you again in the new year. We will start the 2021 GA Wednesday seminar series on the 10th of February. Until then, happy holidays. Thanks. Bye.